Hey. Hello, Kevin. How you doing? Good. How are you, Chad? All right. So um, I, I thought that I've been wanting to do this with you. Uh, I, you know, I watched the uh, video you did with Michael and Danny, and I, I thought that was awesome. And it, oh, you thanks. know, you covered you covered a lot of stuff. And and at first, I was I was like, um, you know, surprised, but you know, I was happy. It was a great, it was great. And, but my, the idea I had with talking to you was more about like your history, you know, when you started and some of the highlights and high points or watermarks or whatever you want to call it, your career. Okay. So it was like, they did everything, but that also the things that you and I have done together, like some of the more important things. Cause I mean, we sure. can't talk about everything you did everything you've cut for me because there just ain't enough time in the day. Yeah. So we're just going to hit like highlights. All right. But uh, I also thought that, you know, let's try to make it like we, we talk so much for so many years about music all the time. Uh, and I just thought, you know, if we could try to make it like we were our conversations, you know I what see, I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Like, like we do this all the time. Like, if yeah. I was a consumer or a record collector, I don't know. It'd be like, hey, they'll get to sit in on kind of a conversation. Like, it'll be a little bit different than the conversations we have. But it, if we could be somewhat like the yeah, conversations sure. we, we always had for how many years? I think, uh, and and I I think. The reason I'm in this business, and it might be the same reason you're in this business, or we're lucky enough to be in this business, is we wanted to see how the sausage was made. We wanted to, or, or we we want, if we weren't doing what we do, we'd be the person wanting to watch this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. So they they just want to see what we wanted to see, and we're lucky enough to see. So right. with YouTube and what's going on, it, it really, people want real, man. They want real people. They don't want to see the professional that doesn't say anything wrong, that doesn't, uh, says everything just politically correct or correct or is worried about giving too much information out. They, right. they, they're real my, life, people. my life's an open book. <laughs> So anyway, let's get started uh, sure, with sure. why don't you just start with uh, when the first time you thought you might get in this business. Uh, let's just go through the beginning. I think maybe when you were 18 or, or just um, start earlier, from earlier, earlier. Well, okay. okay. Let, let me start out by saying as a young kid, I was interested in electronics. I, I started building stuff out of the RCA tube manual when I was like six, I, you know, built a code practice oscillator. Okay. And then fast forward a bunch of, Oh, and I, you know, I got my parents to start buying LPs for me when I was like six. So no kidding. No wow. kidding. The first LP I ever had my parents buy talk about eclectic taste. It was on audio fidelity called the brave bulls. It was bullfight music. No kidding. Before the two on brass or any of that. I'm going to find that record because we got these large collections. It's and a I, great album. Anyway, so uh, and then we bought volume two. Yeah, whatever. But um, anyway, so so I, I was always interested in records. I was always interested in electronics. And so I figured I'd probably wind up maybe in radio or something like that, you know, in terms of, boy, what do I want to do with my life? So anyway, uh, my first year of high school it was 1969. I bet I met Bob McLeod, who was the owner of Artisan Sound Recorders in Hollywood. He had just moved to Hollywood the year before. And um, so he moved into our neighborhood and uh, I was literally babysitting for his kids because I had moved into a neighborhood where I was the only kid over the age of nine. So many of the women in the neighborhood asked me if I, would you know, basically get, get paid to do my homework by sitting there, you know, while they were off doing something else. So um, anyway, so. I met Bob and he asked me if I'd like to see his mastering facility. And I said, sure, that sounds like fun. So I went down. You were a freshman? I was just starting high school. Yeah. 
Wow, okay. And so, uh, yeah, this would have been like January of 69. So, you know, a few months into the school year. Wow, so just, I, when all, just when all the great. Oh, the my God. Things. We yeah. could get into that whole thing. But anyway, I'll tell you a little bit about his history too quickly. But okay, so anyway, I go down to the studio and, you know, I walk in the door and he's got all these gleaming tape machines and a Neumann lathe and all this stuff. And he, he threads up a tape. He had something that was already run down and he was going to be cutting it. So he threads up the tape machine, puts a lacquer on, drops the cutting head, starts cutting. And at that instant, I said, this is what I want to do for a living. It was like a life changing moment. Do you I, remember what record it was? Uh, in all honesty, no, I don't. Um, cool. I think I know what it might have been. It might have been uh, Good Morning Starshine. Remember that record? Oh, is, is that Jonathan Edwards? No, no, it was. Uh, uh, I'm thinking about uh, Sunshine. Go. Uh, good morning, Starshine. Oh wait, Donovan. No, no, it was like the, um, he went by a single name, but like Donovan, but not Donovan. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, no, he, no, it sounds like Bob, Bob cut that. And I think that might have been it. I think that might have been it. That's cool. So anyway, know. you know, I just uh, it was life changing. And uh, and so I spent my entire high school career ditching school whenever I could to go down and hang out at Artisan Sound. Um, I could go into the whole. I mean, I, I, I remember I ditched school to go down and watch him cut L.A. Woman. You know, that was the first time wow. I met Bruce Plotnick. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Anyway, at that point, I, I knew that was what I wanted to do. And everything else basically just got in the way of me becoming a mastering engineer. I didn't want to go to college. Uh, I was getting pretty good grades in my freshman and sophomore year. And then I completely lost interest in high school. I mean, I, I, I maintained, I guess, a B average, but I wasn't getting college level grades. So um, that was the other funny thing. When I graduated... In 72. Uh, oh, well, let, let me just mention. So hanging out at Artisan, you know, Bob had me doing like tape copies for International. So like when Bell Records would order a Fifth Dimension album, they'd order like five tape copies for International. So during the summers, I would be in there. And so I learned how to operate the console and everything, making all the EQ changes and the moves from track to track to make these EQ copies for uh, for International. So I had quite a bit of experience doing that. I hadn't really cut any records yet, but I'd watched it and I knew the process. So in, when I graduated in 72, he was going off to Europe to buy his Ferrari. And, uh, and he said, I'll see you when I get back and we'll talk about it. So he came back in September. I thought he was going to hire me. And he said, uh, well, I've been thinking about it. And I really want you to have a couple of years of college before I hire you. And I was just devastated. I was like, Bob, you never mentioned this before. Well, it turns out my parents had put him up to it. I didn't know that at the time. But um, so I just said, screw it, man. I, I, I'm going to get a job in this industry no matter what. So I went down and I talked to Lauren Whitney at Whitney Recording. And I talked to, to Doug Sachs. I called him up and said, my name's Kevin Gray. I've been hanging out at Artisan. You know, I want to start mastering. I get a call one day from Bob and he's pissed off. He said, I understand you're calling people all over town trying to get a mastering job. I said, well, you're not going to hire me. And he goes, I changed my mind. You're hired. <laughs> so I started in September of, uh, of 72. And what really Man, broke. I can't believe you remember the, the month and everything. Wow. Oh, I, I can tell Great. you details. Uh, well, here, here was what was so cool. The reason he hired me was um, CBS Records had just closed their studio on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood because of a union dispute. I mean, they just shut it down, closed it, done. Well, that studio was doing all of the recut work for Columbia. So Bob got the contract. So Bob's doing all. So September 72, right out of high school, I'm 18 years old. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in the 6430 Sunset Building on the 15th floor. Um, and, and I'm cutting Simon and Garfunkel, Santana, uh, uh, you name it, anybody, Chicago, anybody that was on, you know, I'm, I'm doing those things from 3 a.m., which, which is when I came in in the morning, up until Bob would come in at about 11 in the morning. So that was my shift when I first started there. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was so fun. Um, and then he put me to work cutting seven inch 45. So I was doing a lot of 45 work and then finally LPs, you know, but all within, all before the end of that year. Damn. Nice. So and I, let me just talk a little bit about Bob, because I, I think Bob is one of 
I think Bob is the unsung hero of mastering. In 1969, 70, 71, Bob was doing almost all of the great uh, Warner and Electra stuff. Um, he did. Let, let me ask you. So sure. when you get an artisan record and it has the artisan stamp. Right. Does that mean that Bob cut it or is there more? Did he put initials? We never or? did initials. He never allowed that. He considered all of the engineers there. At that time, there were three. There was me, John Golden, and Bob. And he considered us all to be equal. So he didn't want any differentiation. I mean, if a client if if, if an, a client wanted to put our name on the record, that was okay with him. But he didn't want anything you know, in the lead-ad group. So if you get an artisan um, in those years... Uh, there's a chance it could be you or Bob or, or Golden. Well, from seven, yeah, from seventy through seventy four. Johnny left in seventy four, um, but yeah. Uh, except okay. the other thing to know is that they didn't have the stamp prior to uh, 1970. Okay, so TML. I don't think Mastering Lad had their stamp before 1970 either. Well, maybe if you look on the back of the jacket, it may give you all yeah. names. Yeah. Or, oh yeah. yeah. But, well, you know, you know I mean, I'm just thinking about what I well, I'm thinking about what I'd like to know, and what the consumer would like to know. But uh, but Artisan had a stamp, so yeah, um, yeah, it was a little was elliptical new, uh, circle with an uh, A. Uh, but yeah, and we want to talk about the history of people like this is good because you know, you know I I'm always feel it's important to, to that the Doug Saxes and your story and people's story is documented because i will forget if we don't you know it's just like right. recording the blues guy so I, sure, i'm glad sure. you're doing that so go ahead well so so bob um he was doing so much great warner and and electra stuff he did all of the doors albums from soft parade on he did um he did a lot of the james taylor uh he did a lot of the um uh judy collins uh van morrison uh, no, man, I, <laughs> I should have made a, a list, but anyway, it's, you know, a lot of great stuff. And, you know, outside of that, he was also doing, he did, uh, all of the Jimmy Miller Rolling Stones albums after, um, Beggar's Banquet. That was not done at Artisan, but he did Exile on Main Street. He did, um, uh, Sticky Fingers, even though Doug Sachs gets credited with it, he did it. And, uh, he did, uh, Goat's, Goat's Head Soup. Um, let it bleed. Yeah, that was all done. Oh, by let, it bleed. let it bleed is my favorite. Mine but too. There, there Mine too. Doug, there is a Doug Sack sticky fingers. I know that, maybe, but that was yeah, not maybe, the original. That was, oh, it wasn't it was, original. No, it was cut from an EQ copy. And I have proof of that because when I started at Artisan in 72, all of those master tapes were still in our vault. They'd nice. never left. They'd never been checked out. Nice. So, and another so go, thing that Doug gets credited for that bugs the crap out of me, he gets credited for the first two Doors albums. Those were cut by Sid Feldman in New York. Mastering Lab wasn't even in business when those two albums were done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, hey, that's what why some of these things are good. The the the, uh, the history and the knowledge that uh, only someone like you or or. Um, now, I don't blame Doug Sachs. I don't think he lied about it. I just think that they went off of Discogs or whatever when they put the website together, and, and there it was. You know, I, I had an argument with Doug one time face-to-face -face when we were sitting down at the Mastering Lab. I was visiting one evening, and I said, you know, I just noticed that you have on your website that you were the first independent mastering studio in, in uh, Hollywood. And he goes, yeah. And I said, Doug, Bob McLeod was cutting records in Hollywood a year before you were. Well, yes, but I took out my lease in December of 67 and he opened in January of 68. And I said, yes, and you didn't have a stereo cutter head until June. How many how many mono hit singles did you cut between January and June? <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, it sounds like to me that. Uh, I mean. Yeah, I mean, nobody should claim something that isn't true or say well, anything that isn't true. Well, but Doug's answer, Doug's answer to that was. Well, yeah, but Artisan's not in business anymore. And I said, and so that changes history? <laughs> well, I guess he could then say, out of all, I mean, I'm sure he could word it in a way that, anyway, listen, it sounds like a lot of people, Bernie, Artisan, and Doug, they kind of all started pretty close. Well, to Bernie was at a and remember? He was not an independent. He was a company guy. Okay. Well, I mean, they... 
Doug, Doug Sack, you know, Master and Lab and Artisan were it on the West Coast. Is that right? Yeah, really. But I, I mean, mean, there, it, there were a, lot, a few a lot others. Was happening real in, in a short period of time. Was yeah, that the whole independent yet? mastering I mean, thing got going right around then? Yeah, 60, 70, 71. So, um, so anyway, keep going. So you were talking about. Uh, so yeah, I mean, um, that was my mentor. He taught me how to EQ. He taught me, he taught me how to listen in mastering. You know, how to make sure that levels balanced up from track to track and EQ balanced up so that it it flowed nicely. I mean, that's that was the way Bob described mastering. You know, you're just trying to get the record to flow. When, when did Artisan close, or, or, or did, is, is Bob they sold? Still? They sold in 1978 or nine. Bob got out of the business entirely. Where is Bob? Is he? He's retired. He's living up in Santa Barbara, California. Oh, okay, so this guy's still he's still living. Yeah, but he's been out of the business. You know, it's funny when I stop and I think, you know, I probably cut five times, no, maybe ten times as many records as Bob ever cut. You know, because I've been doing it for however many years. <laughs> and you know, well, he, he basically. Get, we, I'm gonna blow you away when I start talking about the things you cut for me. We're just gonna mention the highlights, the, okay. the, the ones you did, multi, uh, more than one copy of bands. But, uh, but yeah, it, it blows me away too. Like when I think sometimes I've reissued more records than the original Mo Mobile Fidelity. Oh yeah! You wow, know, that's which, impressive. Which kind of like the original the original Mobile Fidelity was a company that I was collecting and was looking up to. Right when it was basically think, Brad Miller and, and and Stan Ricker doing the cutting. Right to think that I ended up doing what they were doing, somewhat you know what they kind of got going, and then I was able to do more than and I and you might even add the old Mobile Fidelity and the new Mobile Fidelity, and we. We could even top that. I mean, it's just amazing, and it just blows me away. So I, I know it kind of know what you're talking about. That how, if you look back, that you did more than than your mentor or the the man, right. you know. Right. But but go ahead. So so um, I'm, I'm gonna try my best. You know, I like to talk. I'm gonna try my best. This is about you and your history. Well, you, you're Please. doing the video, and I appreciate that. And uh, uh, we can go in any direction you want to take it. No, no. I mean, I want you to go through the history. And when okay. we get to the years okay. that we talk about uh, the stuff we've done together. But I wanted uh, one place where your history is, is well documented from the beginning to the end. Okay. So anyway, um, in, in the first year that I was there at Artisan in 72, um, one of the first albums that I got to work on was Europe 72, The Grateful Dead, with uh, uh, Betty Cantor and Bill Wolf, And uh, that was an absolute blast because I was a huge Grateful Dead fan already at that point. Um, Working Man's Dead and, uh, and uh, American Beauty had both been mastered at Artisan before I worked there. And I loved both of those records. So... Um, yeah, so that was a blast, and uh, you know, I the, the thing that was amazing when the Grateful Dead did a, a record, they all came in, the whole band, uh, almost nice. the whole band. I I don't think I ever met Bill Kreutzmann, but you know, I, Phil Lesh and and Bob Weir and and Jerry Garcia um, always came in, and whoever engineered that particular album because they had a bunch of engineers, and then I did a lot of work with Owsley Stanley, you know, Mister LSD, um, so that was uh, interesting. Um, and he did a lot of side projects for the dead, like Garcia's solo albums, Olden in the Way. You familiar with that record? I'm yeah. sure you are. Uh, that was an all time classic. Uh, Dig a Rhythm Band with uh, uh, that's a great record if you're not familiar with it. A lot of people don't know that record. No, no, no. It was with Mickey Hart. Um, it was a couple of Indian drummers and and uh, and Jerry Garcia playing guitar. It was very, very cool. Say what's the title again? Dig a D I G A Rhythm Band. Okay. It's a silver black cover. Somebody should do a reissue of that. That's an awesome record. Well, I mean, after you <laughs> said that, I better go on. I better go find one before the video comes out. Uh oh, yeah, right. Because they're gonna be gone. Yep. Be, so anyway, I'll... so a lot of work with the dead. Um, and uh, and then after John left in '74, I was probably doing the bulk of the work. You know, Bob would come in and do one or two sessions a day. 
and I was doing everything else. I was, I was working 12 hour days, sometimes 16 hour days. It was crazy. Uh, from 72 to 75 or 74 to 75. And then in, in 75, uh, Bob remarried and I got into a terrible fight with his second wife. We never saw eye to eye and she had Bob fire me. It was so funny. Bob came in one night, I'm sitting there working. Bob walks in the door. He's already in tears. And he says, I'm going to have to fire you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> well, that little dispute that you and Pam had today, she can't deal with it. Okay. So I left and I went to Kendon Recorders and I was there for three months, which was the worst three months of my life because working for Kent Duncan was a disaster. But anyway, then one, one night I get a phone call from, from Pam, the woman who was responsible for firing me. And she said, we need to hire you back. Really? <laughs> so I went back for another couple of years, but uh, you know, the old thing about you can never go back. It was, it was never the same after that. But. Well, man, you know, you know, that's why it's sometimes best to not have family or, or your <laughs> wife working for you, you know, because, yeah, yeah. you know, and then, you know, you, you ought to, you, you know, sometimes a man needs to stand up and say, hey, man, you know, this guy is important to me, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, I'll, I'll just stop there, you know, well, and so it's my, also... Yeah, yeah. There's also another good thing about not having partners. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I mean, and you can make the decisions, you know, don't let somebody. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Well, but you shit know, like I, that yeah. happens. I had my first mastering facility from about 79 through uh, 86. It was full time up until 82 and then part time from 82 to 86. And then we wound up selling the business, the, all the equipment to Future Disc. But um, my partner was a guy named Doug Shepard, and he designed all of the equipment, which I'm now using, still using. Um, uh, he designed all the line amplifiers, which are all uh, discrete class A, um, and, and the cutting amplifiers are even class A, 300 watt cutting amplifiers. And he designed all of that stuff. And we were, a, we were you know, in partnership on, on our first mastering business, which was called the cutting system. And um, it... Uh, what what happened basically was the CD was on the horizon in '82. Everybody knew it was coming. Well, but, um, but, but when did you? Okay, you stopped working for uh, Artisan in '77. Okay, then where did you? I so went. I, I freelanced for a year out of uh, Whitney Recording Studio in Glendale. Okay. Lauren, Lauren Whitney was nice enough to let me come in and use their mastering room at nights. And uh, so like so, 1980, where were you? 1980, I was at Location Recording Service. Well, I had my own business. It's Yeah, no, I had my own business in 79, 80, 81. Uh, I was at uh, Location Recording starting in 78 and 79 up until I opened my business. And, and then that, I that went was... back to work for them after I left MCA. The reason we closed down our business, like I said, the CD was well, on the What horizon. was it called again? The Cutting System. The Cutting System. Yeah. Did y'all you have some records you cut and that did y'all have? Yeah, we did. We did. We did. We did Celebration, which was an offshoot of the Beach Boys. It was Mike Love's band. Um, we did. Um, geez, I don't know. I'd have to look at my discography. Oh, we but did I a mean, couple albums with Bob. Did y'all mark the, uh, the 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 lead out or anything? I mean. Oh yeah, I I put KPG at that point. I was putting um, at TCS the cutting system. Um, okay, so, so yeah, we did a Bob Welch years? album. We did a couple Jay Ferguson albums. Um, so yeah, what years were, was the cutting system? The big years were 79 through 82. Okay, um, and, okay. and then late, like November of 82, um, I started at MCA. Um, so Doug Shepard was working with you at the cutting system. Well, actually, he was kind of the silent partner. He had put in a lot of the money. He had designed all the equipment. The two of us had built it all. And we started that way back in 75. It took us four years to get all the gear built, built and ready to go and to build our little room over in, in uh, Burbank. So then when did you start in, in at MCA? In 82. And I worked there basically 80, the end of 82, all the way through 83. And then I got fired in January of 84 for caring. <laughs> for for you trying to... Um... To, 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 
do the right thing and to make exactly. Quality. exactly. Yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of a funny story looking back. I was really pissed off at the time, but basically they were sending me like third generation cassette duplicating masters to cut replacement lacquers from. And I'm talking about stuff like Elton John and, and, you know, big names because it was just the first thing that the guy, the vault guy would pull off the shelf and take over to Whitney, you know, which was where they had their mastering facility to cut. And one day Hoffman came in, we had already started working a little bit on compilations and I just bitched to him. I said, I can't believe the shit tapes that MCA's given me to cut replacement lacquers. He goes, I can fix that. Just give me a call. You know, I'll come over for lunch and I'll bring the master tape with me. What what year was this? In 82. In that year. So or 83, first, 83, 83. The first the second year there? Yeah, it was actually I only really worked there for one full year and a month. <laughs> well, and that was 82 and 83. 83. Yeah, November, well, like it was like November of of 82 through January of, of 84. So it was did you put year. the uh, KG on those KPG at MCA? Okay. Cause I mean, them. I see a lot of those with LB Larry Bowden was Bowden before you or after yeah. or during, same before. time before. Before. before I see a lot of he LBs. Wasn't there that long. He wasn't there there that long either. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of, well, I mean, I mean longer I than I was, he was probably there for three years. I see a good amount of LBs. I see some some of yours, and that I mean, um, well, I'd anyways, have to, I'd have to take the ones that I cut album by album. I'm not I'm not very proud of a lot of that stuff because the tapes they were sending me were crap. They weren't masters. Right. So right. anyway, well, MCA, so anyway, I, I mean, I, MCA. I mean, I hate to say it, and maybe things have changed. I mean, uh, you know, but. At the time when MCA was MCA, only MCA, they kind of went to the cheaper pressing plants, it seemed. Well, they had their own, Gloversville and Pinckneyville, which were horrible. They were the two worst pressing plants in the country. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> they like they weren't. Uh, we called them sandpaper and tar paper. Those were the nicknames for Gloversville and, and Pinckneyville. Right. They got that the, the little uh, that little logo. The P and the yeah, right. It looks like barbells or something. Which, right, right. Yeah, it's, um, G -G but anyway, so 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 uh, so you call Hoffman. So I call Hoffman. He'd send he'd he'd come by for lunch, drop off the master tape. Um, I'd cut it wherever it was, whatever it was, and then he'd come the next day for lunch and and take the tape back. The problem was they were always in a giant giant hurry for these. I mean, these are albums anywhere from 20 to five years old. So, you know, they were just keeping them in the catalog. I can't see what rush a replacement lacquer would be on a five-year-old album, right? And so I got called on the carpet the first time that Toy Moritomo, who was the production manager at MCA, found out that I had done this. And she said, you never, ever do that again. Uh, that you, you do not have the right to do that. I send you the tapes. The tapes I send you, you cut from which led to the really ugly story that I still get asked about, about Steely Dan Asia. The Steely Dan Asia that I cut at, at uh, MCA was from a really bad tape copy. And I cut it flat because it said on it that it was EQ'd. And I said, okay, Toy, this is the shit you give, send me. This is the shit that goes on the record. And so, and you know, guys like Pincus have called me. What did you do on that album? Why does that sound so bad? And I said, it's a long story. So there it is. You just heard it. <laughs> well, do you want to talk about the Asia? You want to talk about Asia when it comes up? Oh, yeah. I got, I, I got to fix it. You know? Yeah. When yeah. when we did when we did it for Cisco, I think we Remember really, what year that was? It was at Acoustec. It was probably 2002. I'm guessing. Well, 2002, 2003. You know what? I, I had that behind me, but I moved it uh, to another no room. Problem, but, no problem. To, okay, 2002, 2003. Yeah. And uh, I remember, did you say they, they ran the tape backwards? Like, like yeah, they, they wouldn't. At that point, I had not been vetted to receive master tapes. So they had, yeah, we, we made a backwards 30 IPS half inch of the quarter inch master tape. Um, and... A lot of people don't know about the trick of, of uh, backwards tape copies, but 
very often a backwards tape copy can actually sound better than the master tape. Most people don't believe this. Oh, better, By the than way, the master. Better, better than the master. Better. Better. The first guy that ever clued me into that was Bruce Botnick. He told me that way back in 72 or 73. He asked me, he asked me to flip the tape over and make the tape copy backwards. I went, what? And he goes, no, it'll sound better than the master tape. I went, what? You know, I thought he was pulling my leg, you know, but he was completely is serious. Is there a quick uh, explanation or is it? Well, if you stop and think about it on a transient, you know, say a, a, a drum hit on a snare drum, right? There's a very, very sharp attack followed by a long decay. Well, you run it backwards and you get the decay first and then the attack. So it doesn't look, it's not as sharp when you play it backwards. When you turn around and play it forwards, it's the same, you know. But it, it, it when, when all of the attacks are happening at the end instead of at the beginning of a transient, um, you can get a, a more accurate re representation of the waveform. Interesting, interesting. So... so yeah. So you, did, so, uh, so you put out Asia, but I mean, at the time there wasn't no, you didn't get any, nobody commented on that. I mean, you just cut it like another record and. Oh, no, that was for Cisco. Oh, you. No, oh, no, I know. I'm going back to. Uh, to the. Anyway, that, that album. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was just a, a replacement locker, you know. It, it right, wasn't right. even a well, album. Just, I don't just think to finish on that. the Cisco, um, yeah. Yeah. that was. A great sounding record. Actually, that was probably, yeah, it was Cisco. It was before Impex, right? Go yeah, ahead. yeah. And it was great sounding. Uh, at the time, um, they had a problem. I don't know if you ever heard about the white line. Oh, was that on the line fever? Well, on, RTI. On the sleeves, uh, the sleeves. The sleeves, yeah. The pink sleeves, uh, yeah. No, no, no. That's what they went to the pink sleeve because oh. of the. Oh. We call it White Line Fever at okay. Acoustic Sounds, and that was one of the most affected records. Some of the uh, my jazz reissues that we'll talk about had that. I yeah. mean, we normally couldn't really hear it, but customers swear they heard it. And, okay. And so, you you know, I mean, nobody wants a white line on a black record. You no, know, of course it, not. It, it, uh, but, hey, what can you do? You know, right. the license went out these are the records all i could do is give them their money back but i gave so many people uh their money back and we probably had about 50 copies with the white lines we sold for over a hundred dollars two hundred dollars right. a piece then the, the people are happy to get it uh because it sounds so awesome so anyway we go back to uh you and hoffman and you what year you think you cut the uh asia for mca for, yeah, it would have been at eighty three. So that and it might have like, just been one side. It might have been just like the A side or something. I don't remember. What well, you know was. what's funny is, I mean, that wasn't that old in eighty three. If you think about yeah. it, yeah, no, I know it was only five. The record probably record. came out in seventy seven or seventy eight. Yeah, it did. Okay, so that's like five years, right? right. Yeah. Like, uh, so but okay. I, so, I have a funny story about the Cisco one though. Okay. So we cut it, and uh, apparently it had to be sent to Elliot Shiner to approve who was one of the mix engineers on the record. Right. And he's kind of the archivist and the main guy in charge now, I think on most of the, or was in, in that year for Steely Dan. So um, he was actually on the West coast. He was out here mixing a record a 5.1 at the time. And so we sent it to him directly and I get this irate phone call from, from Elliot. And he says, uh, is this Kevin Gray? I said, yes. And he goes, um, I'm, I'm just listening to your uh, Steely Dan Asia. And he goes, uh, I can't allow that to come out. And I went, what? And he said, it, it sounds frankly terrible. And I said, wow. Uh, okay. I, I said, maybe you got a bad pressing of it. You know, I mean, we put a lot of work into that and we were a being it against like the best pressing we could get of it. And um, he said, well, I, I can't allow this to go out. And, and I said, well, okay. And I hung up. And so I called AB and she said, yeah, I know. I already talked to him. And so she goes, what do we do? And I said, uh, I don't know. I don't know. So finally, I, it was just bugging me because I thought, that's a great sounding record. I can't believe that. So I called Elliot back. He'd given me his number. I said, Elliot, um, this is Kevin Gray again. I said, I have a huge favor to ask of you. And I said, he said, what's that? I said, well, well, first of all, let me ask you. I said, what did you what did you play that on? And he said, oh, I played it on one of the turntables over at Warner Brothers. I said, 
one of the turntables or one. I said, what kind of a turntable was it? And he goes, um, I'd never heard of it before. It's called a Newmark. And I went, oh, God. I said, I have one favor to ask of you. Just one favor. Let me send a brand new one, you know, to your home on the East Coast. And when you get back there from finishing this project, would you take one more listen to it? And uh, he said, okay, fine. Oh, I got the most apologetic phone call from him about a week or two later. He said, Kevin, I just listened to your Asia. It sounds great, man. It sounds great. I'm so sorry about this. And I said, you know, it kind of, I don't want to say it happens all the time, but it happens too often. I said, uh, it, I'm not surprised. Uh, I, I, when you were telling me the story, I should have realized the next part of the story and I didn't, <laughs> but it happens to me. And I'm not going to mention names because I still work with some of the oh, yeah. people. And I know but I have people with like, call me with a turntable and ask us, um, well, it, it's also been on one of the projects we're going to talk about, but I, I still don't want to mention names because we do a lot of business with them. And it's the same thing on, on that particular one I'm thinking about. And they're wanting us to make decisions based on what they think with their cheap turntable. And I know, uh, one time we had to have a limo pick up a guy and bring him to Fremer's house. Uh huh. Uh, you know, Actually, Fremer's done that for me a couple of times too. I right. I mean, if you remember the one I'm talking about, don't don't mention it. But we had to send a limo to get the guy to go to Fremer's house, and then right. Fremer played it for him. And it was one you cut, and it's oh, something okay. we're going to talk about. But okay. we're not going to. Okay. And okay. the guy heard it. But I mean, man, it was going to cost tens of thousands, at least ten thousand dollars worth of shit to go through, <laughs> and what to make it sound worse, so yeah, his right. cheap turntable could play it. This even happened recently on a big title that we just, where the guy said, "Well, you know, the piano uh, is," and I didn't want to say. Um, I already knew what turntable he's playing. I, I didn't really want to even embarrass him and say. And what and what system are you making these critical judgments on that Bernie Grunman mastered <laughs> of the original three track? Right. Uh, that what um, you know, like I'm gonna grab a you know, and are, you're water. supposed to be listening to the ticks and pops and the flaws. Like <laughs> we're not really asking you. To critique the music, right? The, the sound, yeah. Is it is there a flaw or not? Right. And it's anyway. I got to stop there because um, I get it. <laughs> I, you know, it's kind of an old story for both of us, right? And, and then they'll we'll both be uh, connected on on that uh, those things, but you know. Sometimes there's another thing that happens where a lot of the bands like to use the original engineer, which is cool. Um, a lot of things are going in my head uh, where they they like they, the, the original engineer is still included. And a lot of times and sometimes. Uh, I'll go back and say, sometimes those guys catch shit. Okay, like, you remember the dog barking on the Nard Jones? Yep. You remember that? Like, yep. we, we cut yeah, it. Yeah, that, that had been flown us. in on mastering when they did it. It wasn't on the original. Right, it wasn't on. Yeah. There was a dog barking. And we didn't, I mean, I didn't know the record that well to remember the right. dog. And they caught it. So, listen, even the people that do create what I would say kind of trouble, or, or they're not going to improve the record by doing what they think they've same people have caught things right that we appreciate it can work both ways it works both ways it really right. really works both ways right um i was thinking about something um they've caught things uh oh uh go back to where they they have the original producer 
they know stuff. They were there with the recording. They help us a lot. Yeah. So I can't, um, for everything they, they throw a, uh, a wrench in the project. They, they catch a lot of stuff too. But the other thing I, um, you know, maybe, well, it's funny though. Sometimes we got in, or sometimes they will, will have some problems and then I'm not thinking about it. And I'm like, man, I need to include this person in. They're helping us and I need to include them. Like, hey, can we hire you to be a part of this? Uh-huh. Um, and sometimes that 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 helps. Yeah. And uh, now I've got to decide whether. Yeah. Sometimes. Anyway, all right. Let's keep going. So we're we're uh, at at Asia. You work for MCA. Right. Let, let's go. Let's let, pick up there. Let, let, let's cut those apart again. I don't ever want to be tied to that record at MCA. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's, well, that's, we, the, we, that's the title I MCA. try to forget. Yeah. Talk, talk up this. Let's continue. I mean, okay. the fact okay. is, so you were at MCA doing Asia. Right. Pick it up there. The, the, okay. the reason we we well, know just, you did that great one. That well, I'll just say. The two great Asias is the original AB. It's funny when we talk about AB and right. It's an AB, ABC that Bernie did. Yeah. And then the Cisco. Right. Okay. And I've AB'd them. I've got two turntables. They're with pretty the close, smooth. aren't they? Huh? They're pretty close. Right. I've got the two, two turntables, same cartridge, same arm, same turntables. You can uh, through the Chris them. Smooth mastering uh, console. Uh -huh. And we've we've a beat them uh, on uh, many many times, and uh, so you're still at MCA. You do Asia, right? Well, I did. <laughs> you gotta keep mentioning that, don't you? Okay. Well, no, I just mentioned. Let's let's, let's go. <laughs> okay. Let me let's tell you about some of the stuff that I did at, at the year I was at MCA. I, I cut some pretty cool stuff. I um, one of my favorite uh, soundtrack albums, which many people have never heard. Was the soundtrack from Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence? It was a David Bowie album. The composer was Ryuichi Sakamoto, who was probably better known for uh, The Last Emperor and some other stuff. But anyway, so I did that record. Um, did the Who's Greatest Hits, which I'm kind of proud of because I was responsible for doing all of the tape transfer work on that, in addition to cutting the parts. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I cut the I cut the fix. Reach the beach there um so you were cutting new new records to come yeah. out like not just recuts you were no 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 i you know i was actually the head of the mastering department so i mean i was Whoa. doing it all and they were even I, I even did outside work you know i did an album for um i can't remember the name of the band he's a canadian guy named tom cochran it was a fairly big record um red rider Red Rider, I think they were. Oh, called. yeah. Yeah, I remember the name. Uh, and then I, um, and that was that was an outside project. I don't think that was for MCA. And then I also did uh, uh, Tracy Ullman's album, and I did uh, uh, what's her name, um, Canadian female vocalist. Uh, not Joni Mitchell, I'm sure. No, no, <laughs> no. Helen Reddy. Helen Reddy. Oh, Helen did, Reddy from yeah, Canada. Did her yeah. album on MCA, yeah. It was big time, boy. She was at the top. Yeah, she was. Well, she was kind of on the decline at that point, but she was still, you know, she had had a lot of head records. Anyway, so, yeah, it was um, a lot of great product. I don't I don't have a hard time when I think about the projects that I did, but just the whole politic thing at MCA was horrible. I, I You know, I'd never worked for a large company before. I mean, I don't think I'd ever worked for a company that had more than 10 employees, you know, before I started at uh at uh, MCA, and that was just culture shock. So yeah. that lasted about 
a year, what, eight, two days, basically three, a year. Like a year. And then what did you do from there? I went to uh, location. I went back to location recording service and I worked there mostly on syndicated radio shows. But uh, did a Beach Boys album called MIU. Um, did some other stuff. <laughs> Remember the infamous Princess Stephanie? She was uh, uh, of Monaco. She was uh, the famous actor. Oh, oh uh, her when daughter. You, when people say prince, I think of the musician. You're talking about a real prince and princess. princess. Yeah, yeah, prince. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, uh, she went by Stephanie. Anyway, did her, her solo album. Um, yeah, and some other stuff. It was, you know. So then how, how long were you at, uh, location recorders? I was there from 84 until 90, about 94. And then I went so to the future CDs disc. were just coming out in like 84, right? I mean, is that the right. Some right. And, yeah. and, you know, that was, that was when I got basically Steve Hoffman to come in and we did all of the, uh, we started doing all the DCC stuff. Um, so when you said 84 to 94, uh -huh. you were at location. Right. And, you know, we did all of the early DCCs, all the silver CDs, and then a lot of the gold CDs there. Well, they owned Shelter at the time. Yeah. Uh, a Marshall. Yeah. Which uh, is one of my favorite labels. Uh, Absolutely. The Phoebe Snow's fantastic recording that you ended up cutting for me later at 45, which would just knock. And that was a big, big record. That right. was huge. Uh, Leon Russell. Don't forget Leon, Leon Russell. Leon Russell was one of the biggest artists, and people don't really know that. Oh, like God, now. yes. Like, yeah. he was number one man on the top, man. He was up with the Stones and the Beatles and all of that at the time. I agree. But, and it, what's funny is... I was a huge fan. Right. He So the Leon Russell, the J.J. Kale, although I don't think Marshall... That was kind of pulled out of the the shelter catalog when he bought it. I think ah. JJ Kale was able to pull his stuff out. Okay. But we, well, you had Freddie King. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, there was a uh, um, Freddie King. Um, um, Every time I think of Freddie King, I think of Poker's his thing. The, what's that? Oh, 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 yeah. The uh, the in in uh, American American band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> play play I, all I, night with Freddie King. Let me tell you, focus his thing. Well, I didn't even know. I always thought uh, they said something else right there. Oh, really? What is uh, the poke is insane? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I that's what I think. I th always thought it said poker's his thing. Uh huh. Really, I, I yeah. think I always thought the polk is insane. Like that was his. Oh yeah. Thing. Oh, you could do a whole thing on misheard lyrics. <laughs> I, I mean, I love that song, man. That was right. like when I was. That was like 1973. Um, that was one of the songs in the jute boxes when I was a kid. Sure. So, so anyway, they they had shelter. You y'all did all the shelter. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Leon Russell. Freddie King. Um, you know, his his real name was Russell Bridges, right? Freddie Leon, King? Leon Russell. Oh, Leon Russell. Oh, okay. Yeah, the famous okay, story, yeah. The, the story that really got me on that one was somebody, I, I'm pretty good friends with the guy who did the Wrecking Crew movie. You know, his dad was one of the Wrecking Crew guys. So um, he? he gave me who? a stack. Uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, You'll uh, think of it. Yeah, I will. Uh, anyway, yeah, it'll come to me. Anyway, he gave me, he gave me a stack of the American Federation of Musicians Local 47 track sheets, you know, on all of the, the great recordings from the late 60s, basically. Not all, but I mean, you know, a stack of them that, that high. And uh, I kept thinking, now, wait a minute. Leon Russell was one of the piano players. How come his name is in here? So I go start looking through the piano players. And I see Russell Bridges, Russell Bridges, Russell Bridges, Russell Bridges. And I was like... So I Google Russell Bridges. Oh, it's Leon Russell. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think Dr. John, even oh. Lincoln Mayarga was like the third string. Oh, absolutely. Group. I, so wouldn't even Lincoln say, Mayorga, I wouldn't even say third. Was, I think he was kind of second string. Second, yeah. yeah. I well, mean, yeah, he was, not so busy. You know what? They had other piano players, but they would bring him in for harpsichord. Or if they needed a pipe organ, he'd go over to Whitney and record the pipe organ over there. 
that kind so of stuff. So it was Leon Russell, Dr. John, uh, who else? Glenn Campbell. You're talking about the yeah, known musicians? No, I was just talking about piano players. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, oh, uh, Don Randy. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, when I bought Doug Sachs Mastering Lab, we needed to move some stuff. So I went to a U Haul to buy some boxes. So I go in there. I said, man, I'm buying these boxes. Oh, I need more. I need more. He's like, well, what do you need? I says, well, I bought the mastering lab down and the guy's eyes got real big. He said, uh, Don Randy's my dad. And I guess Don Randy owned the baked potato. Yeah. Still yeah, does. He goes, Don Randy's my dad. He goes, boy, he was all interested, you know, and, and, uh, that oh, was the wrecking crew the guy way. I was trying to think of is Tom. Well, the, the artist, the wrecking crew guy was Tommy Tedesco. His son Denny was the guy who did the movie. The, the right, right, the production. His great guitar player, Tommy. Absolutely. So anyway, so you worked there, and when did DCC start coming to you? Um, what I year think, do you think? Uh, well, okay. <laughs> Even though I was working. I, I had a bad habit of working two places at once. Even though I was working at a location recording nights, I was coming in days and doing mastering with Hoffman at Future Disc because they had three rooms. So um, so I started there. We, we did all the Ray Charles stuff there, I think, at Future Disc. Yeah, yeah, I forgot yeah. Ray Charles. Right. But, but who owned uh, location mastering? A guy named Steve Guy, who was also a mastering engineer. Okay, um, now... What about now? So future. Hold on a second. I gotta. I gotta get rid of this. I'm gonna unplug my phone so it doesn't ring again. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so. Um, Steve Guy on location. Steve recording? Guy at Location Records and. Uh, location Recording Service (LRS). Uh huh. Okay, and who owned Future Disc? Steve Hall, who Steve was. Hall. I got Steve Hall's job at MCA when he left to start his own place. So, okay. so you were asking about Larry Bowden. So Larry didn't even immediately precede me. I only remember Larry Bowden working there in like 79 and maybe in 80. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I asked Doug Sachs about Larry Bowden and La Doug was like, man, that guy, he really somebody, I mean, he really is good. And, and, uh, I mean, I, I was like kind of impressed me that right there, you know, I was like, wow. Hmm. So uh, anyway, Larry, very passionate. I learned a lot about Larry uh, after uh, he's got quite an amazing story. But so um, so anyway, so you from 84 to 94 at Location Recorders. Right. And you started at Future Disc before 94. Doing in, stuff in 90, in well, yeah. <laughs> See, we sold our business to them to build their second room. So so they had my disc cutting system in the second room there. Um, at Future Disc. At Future Disc, right. And so I went on board and, and, and worked there for a solid year in like 86, I think it was, to help them get the room going, the second room going. And that was when Hoffman started bringing in CD mastering. And so even though it was the disc cutting system I had sold to them, we were using my console um, and uh, and doing the DCC stuff. And then uh, in 89, I talked LRS into putting in CD mastering, and that's when he brought it to LRS. And so from 89 to 94, we were doing all the DCC stuff there. And then in 92 is when they jumped back into vinyl. So, I'm, you know, we were cutting vinyl there too again for uh, for DCC. So if you, do you feel like we've covered everything till 92? Pretty much. Oh, well, you had asked me about something. Maybe we can make this a whole separate, separate subset, but, but about the Victor Feldman directed disc. Oh yeah. No, I wanted you to, <laughs> when did that happen? Yeah. That no, happened we, back in 77, uh, right after when I was in that year that I freelanced, that I was no longer at Artisan. I was looking for something to do. And I had a buddy who was also, I, you know, I could I wasn't unemployed because I was doing some part-time mastering, but um, a buddy of mine was unemployed. And so we got together and decided to do a direct -to disc recording out of the clear blue. In, in 1977? In 1977, yeah. How old were you then? 24. 
that's pretty doggone young to be, you know, uh, because a release back then was a lot more important. Uh, like like the, it, it was more of a major release and a direct to disc at the time. So yeah, yeah. to be 24 and to pull that off. Oh, you, you told me the story before. I can't really remember like how you, you called him and he. Well, let me, me, let me back up. I so, so my friend Bob Vanderveen and I decided we wanted to do a direct-to-disc. And we didn't know what we wanted to do. We just wanted to do a direct-to-disc. So he had a friend at Nautilus. So uh, we called him and talked to him. And uh, What was his name? Roger Roars. Okay. And so uh, Roger said, yeah, we'd, we'd be up for putting out a direct-to-disc if you guys want to do one. What were you thinking? And we thought, oh, we were just kind of thinking about doing a jazz trio, you know, something piano oriented. Nah, we don't we don't find too much, you know, need for that. You know, there, there, there's not a big market for that. So I said, well, even if it's a name piano player. And he said, yeah, yeah. He goes, now, if you could make it like a quintet or, you know, quartet, quintet, something like that, you know, maybe we'll have something to talk about. Well, you got to remember, Steely Dan had just done Asia and Victor Feldman was all over that record. Um, wow. You know, he played, I think, I can't remember if it was Josie or Peg. I mean, there were two songs that he, he played the electric piano on. Joe Sample played the other ones. But anyway, um, and I had this record that he had done with an engineer friend of mine called The Artful Dodger, which came out on Concord. It wasn't originally recorded for that. They, they bought the master. So anyway, um, I thought, man, he'd be a great guy. And he had played on the very first Sheffield directed disc. He was the vibes player on it. Wow, cool. And, and this guy's perfect, right? So I got his number. And I'd never met him, didn't know him from Adam. Got his number from the Musicians Union. Cold called him. Victor, my name's Kevin Gray. I'm a mastering engineer. I'm starting up an audiophile label. And we'd really like to have you do a directed disc recording. Like, silence. He goes, eh. I don't think I'm interested in doing any more direct discs. And I went, really? And he goes, it's too much pressure. I get union scale for doing it. I don't make any royalties off of it. No, nah, I don't think I'm interested. I went, well, wait, 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 wait. I said, no, no, we're not talking about as a sideman. We're talking about you as the artist. And he's like, oh, yeah? Hmm. Well, who else would be playing on it? I said, that's up to you, Vic. You know, who would, who would you like? Well, I wasn't calling him Vic then, but I did later. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, who would, you, just, yeah, just who, would you like, who would you like to play with on it, you know? And he goes, well, you know, I've got a little group that I'm do, kind of doing some stuff with right now. You know, we have Harvey Mason on bass, uh, on uh, drums, and and uh, Chuck DeMonico on bass. And I said, hey, <laughs> that sounds great, you know? And he goes, yeah, we got, we got a few other people, too. Hubert, Hubert Laws is back in New York, and he goes, I played with him. And he goes, I'd love to have him on flute. I'm like, well, first, actually... First, he was talking about, um, who's the other, Bud Shank. He was talking about Bud Shank originally, but Bud, for some reason, couldn't do it. So then he called Hubert, and Hubert said, yeah, I'll come out for it. So, you know, go back to Nautilus, and they're excited as I'll get out about it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it actually came out on Coherent Sound, but distributed by Nautilus. Yeah, I mean, I've been selling records since uh, 84, 86, so... You know that was that's a record we see all the time, and we, you know, any direct to disc is something that we're interested in reselling. So, uh, you know, it just took 20 years to figure out it was you, and and <laughs> to hear the story about how young you were to pull something like that off is, you know, really a, a story that needs to be known. Because, Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> well, you know, same same here. You know what I mean? Like you just. Uh, but to look back on and realize how young you were and how important that was at the time and that, you know, it's a record that we get buy and sell. And after this video, you know, whatever we have in stock uh, might be gone. And, I'm very uh, proud of the record. I, I got uh, two follow up stories to that. First of all, in about 1988, I think it was Concord bought the tapes, which I had stupidly made a deal with, with Victor that the tapes would revert back to him a year after the record came out. Now you got to remember this was all before the CD and all that stuff. Right? right. So I thought, well, what would I need the tapes for anymore? It was a directed disc. There was no tape actually used. They were just right. run So I sold the tapes to, to Victor a year. So later. Y'all recorded simultaneously. Yes. Yeah. The tape. Well, that, so, that was smart. 
Yeah, so they so the tapes went to Victor. Victor passed away in '86, and his sons sold the project to Concord, and they put it out as Rio Nights, without any of the original artwork, all the same tracks except they added two direct to two track things that had been done that I also engineered after that, that they also got the rights to. So they, they mixed those two tracks into that record to make it a longer CD. Well, what did you and, do on the record? Were you cutting the lacquer or were you doing the recording and mix? Were you at the board or were you cutting lacquer? Oh, no, I, I was cutting. Alan Sides, who was the guy who had done the Artful Dodger. Oh, shit. We got Alan. Alan came over to Whitney, brought his own microphones, brought all of his tube mics. Oh, so and, and just Victor Feldman and just Alan Sides, you know, no... No, no names. No. Yeah. Right. 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 So, wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's, uh, yeah. So Alan, Alan engineered too. that. Yeah. Now. Okay. So that's the, that's the first. Oh, oh. So they put this thing out as Rio Knights. My name is not mentioned on it. Bob Vanderveen's name is not mentioned on it. And they have the producer as being Bob Edmondson, who is the trombone player in the Tijuana Brass. What the hell his involvement with it? I have no idea. He wasn't at the session. He had no involvement with the record and he's listed as the producer. Well, I guess the way you could look at that is that makes you every other record that's ever been released, there might be, especially the old ones when the the uh, the owner of the label might put his songs as give himself some songwriting credit mm -hmm. or give himself some producer credit. So, so anyway, I mean, now that I'm on great terms with Concord, because I do a lot of work for him. I might bring that up to somebody over there and say, "Hey, you know, really all the all the info on that album, if it's ever released again, should be changed because it's not Bob Edmondson; it was me." Anyway, so that's the first thing. But there's another story. So we go back to Nautilus. You know, they sold I think forty thousand copies of that Dang. album. <laughs> yeah, which is incredible, right? And they were blown away. They sold more on that, I think, than they did on any of the Japanese. JVC directed discs. Which wow. Sell. So, I mean, what were, do you remember what you deal you made or what you were getting paid out of it? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Nautilus made 33%. Bob and I, my, my partner, we made 33% and Victor made 33%. He got wow. a nice cut for doing that. So everybody, this is after um, the cost. Yeah. Yeah. After, yeah. after all of the costs are incurred. Yeah. Wow, I mean, for a 24 years old, uh, <laughs> the, I mean, hey, 40,000, that adds up, man. So, hey, man, we wanted to do, you know, a second album. This, so, we, of course. So, th so, this is hilarious. So, we, looking back on it, it wasn't at the time. So, we go to Nautilus and we went, hey, guys, do you want to do another Victor Feldman? Well, we could do another Victor Feldman. You know, we'd really like to have a big artist. What do you mean by a big artist? Oh, we'd like to have Fleetwood Mac or the Eagles or Paul McCartney. And I said, really? So Kevin Gray got on the phone with Irving Azoff about the Eagles and with John Eastman about Paul McCartney and actually had a nice phone conversation with both of those individuals, but also a flat no. So I go back to Nihilus and say, well, you know, I haven't tried talking to whoever the other person was that they mentioned, but I, I said, you know, talk, talk to the Eagles management, talk to McCarty's management, no interest there. Well, you know, keep trying and let us know when you got somebody. Five years go by. I get a phone call from Nautilus. They said, Hey, Kevin, would you like to cut a Victor Feldman directed disc? I said, yeah, man. Do you want me to call him and set it up? He goes, Oh no, it's already set up. We're just asking you to cut it. I went, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You told me you weren't interested in doing another Victor Feldman. Well, that was five years ago. The secret of the Indies. Yeah. So did so, you cut it? Yeah, I cut it. I'm a whore. No, actually. Well, hey, I mean, look. Uh, and I love that record, too. I love that as much. Well, not as much, but almost as much as in my pocket. So, you know, for the people that might not know, I mean, Nautilus uh, did some direct-to-disc, but they also, the, the, the John Clemmers were pretty awesome. Yes. The first one. Yes. Straight from the heart. See, yes. you know what I was going to, I'm doing a video of what people used to want to buy. Right. Uh, and I forgot about that. I've been writing down albums 
of what audiophiles used to want to collect and buy. Right. The, the new audiophiles are looking for that. And right. that is a perfect one. It's straight from the heart, John Clemmer. Yeah. And oh, I just yeah, wrote it down. Yeah, and I have this because I've been thinking about, you know, different things like Ry Cooter Jazz, Ricky Lee Jones' first album. Right. right. The Power of the Orchestra. I'm going to go through that. But, uh, but anyway, so Nautilus was kind of neck and neck with Mobile Fidelity at the time. Right. For half speed oh, masters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which I tried to talk them out of, by the way. <laughs> why, why don't you? It's a good opportunity. What do you think about? Uh, well, you did you talk about uh, the the uh, half speed masters? I mean, you don't have to go into it, but uh, it's it's not your preferred choice of <laughs> right. a master. Right. 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 Uh, we, so, we can um, I don't think uh, I need to rehash that. But. Right, I think you went through it. Uh, a lot of people don't think that uh, half-speed mastering is. Plus, you, you can't really hear the music while you're cutting, right? I mean, it's like. Right. right. Well, okay, let me just tell you one thing about that. Um, mm -hmm. I got a call, phone call from Alan Sides. He had done a Freddie Hubbard album, um, and they half-speed mastered it. Uh, Bernie had cut it originally, and um, Nautilus put it out, you know, was trying to put it out half-speed. And Alan called me up and he said, Kevin, I want to come by and play something for you. Or maybe he wanted me to hear it over at Ocean Way. I don't remember. And I went over, he popped it on the turntable, and it was the half-speed cut of this Freddie Hubbard album. I don't remember the name of it. It was probably in 83, 84. And uh, it sounded like crap. I mean, it was there was something seriously wrong with the high end. It was just way too bright, distorted, ugly, ugly sounding. So he brought the tape over and I cut the album and we sent refs to Nautilus and said, which of these would you rather put out? You know? And they went, Whoa, your sounds so much better. And I went, uh, huh. Well, guess what? I they either didn't put it out or they had them radically do something in the EQ or something. I don't know what the follow-up was. I didn't wind up cutting it. And I don't know. No, if they, I don't maybe remember. they cut it. Maybe they cut it full speed and said they cut it half speed. I don't know, but I don't even know the. Re I mean, you know, most of the Nautilus because that was something I used to sell a lot of, like all right. the original Mofis, all the original Nautilus. So I knew even even the coherent Victor Feldman, uh, Randy Sharp, all of those direct disc, and they uh, did uh, the the half speeds. So mm -hmm. okay, so you worked uh, to ninety four. In with uh, the future disc and DCC, you said started in '92. Well, I started my first reissue. Future disc. Oh yeah, future disc started in '82. I I started there in '94. Oh, you started at future disc in '94. Right. Right. Okay. So you worked at. I did future the disc. I did the. the Heavy vinyl thing for MCA, which was the first major label to jump back into records. Right. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna talk about this. Uh, a lot of the things you're talking about. So you you started in '94 with Future Disc. Yes. But in '92, DCC started with you cutting at location. No, in '80, it '86. Right, but when did they start reissuing vinyl? In 92. At, at location. At location, right. Okay, then they, well, in 90 is when I did my first reissue. So back at that time, you had DCC in 92, Audio Quest was doing new recordings. You know, you, you, you had reference recordings. Mm -hmm. You had Chesky, but... As far as reissuing vinyl, you had uh, me in 90 and 91, 92, DCC in 92. I think Mobile Fidelity came back with the what they call the Anna Disc. Right around that time. Right around. So back when people were buying albums in like 1990, 91, 92, 93, 94, they didn't have the choices like they did now. Right. They had 
Analog Productions, DCC, uh, MoFi, the, the Anadis MoFi, and AudioQuest as new records because that's when RTI first started doing the 180 gram. Right. Was about 92. Right. Okay, so we'll pick it up now around. So you worked uh, in 94, you started at Future Disc. Correct. Okay, so what about what's what's some of the one of the first CDs? Maybe that's a good a watermark thing. Like, do you remember the first CD you worked on? Who? Uh, well, yeah, it would have been DCC in like the 80s, the mid 80s when I was working part time okay. at Future Disc for DCC. All you know, right. it been, the Ray Charles probably would have been one of the very first. Uh, right. We also we also did um, we did some stuff for Sound eighty in Minneapolis. That's the, uh, uh, Tom Jung. Yeah, it was Tom Jung's uh, uh, recording. Some of the BBs kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, we did it. Did, did you get to meet Ray Charles when or, or, or talk to him at all? Like when? No, but I spoke to him on the phone and he was really pissed off. But I calmed him down. <laughs> Is it, Brother can Ray, you, can you discuss why he was well, upset? Yes, I can tell you in a nutshell what had happened. He had gotten the first CD master, first CD that DCC did, and his hearing was so acute, he could tell immediately that it was not from the right tape. Wow. And it was just what had been sent to DCC. That was when Steve got permission to actually go into the vault with Ray and go through each of the tapes that we were going to be using. And uh, so, man, that must have been hard to talk to your hero like kind of person and him yelling at you for something that you. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. when you got to just bite your tongue. And yes, well, sir, he, yes, sir. the first words out of his mouth is where the fuck's Hoffman? <laughs> Hold on just a second. I'll get him for you because I didn't want to talk to him much. But anyway, well, you know, the thing that one of our biggest sellers right now is the uh, Genius Plus Soul, which we had you cut for us uh maybe 10 years ago yeah and we're using the same part uh-huh for the acoustic sounds verve series okay because like you know why wh why reinvent the wheel why yeah you know we have the part and the right. part's awesome and i remember you calling me man dude these are the masters it even has braille on it yes yes because he labeled everything with braille tape yeah yeah no ray ray was an incredible person an incredible musician um yeah amazing 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 guy that, and that great, reminds, and great sounding recordings that reminds me of uh a good uh thing that i wanted to mention sure. like who is some of the artists i think you uh mentioned louis prima you worked directly with yeah in uh probably about 1973 um he and um uh Ruby Ruby Keeler, right? Was that her name? Yeah. Uh, uh, Ruby Keely Smith. Ke Keely Smith. Yeah, Ruby Keeler. Keely Smith. Yeah. Maybe we can add it. Okay. I'll just <laughs> so, start again. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so I'll just start around again. nineteen. Yeah, around nineteen seventy three, Louis and Keely Smith uh, came into Artisan, and we were doing a compilation album. And um, it was the first time I had met either one of them. I was familiar with. Louis and his music and some of his early hits. I was not that familiar with Keeley, but the amazing part of the story looking back was I didn't know their relationship. And, you know, she had been the singer in his band and then they married and then they had one of the most tumultuous relationships in, in music history. And uh, I think literally went to knock down, drag out blows and they weren't speaking to each other for years. And here I was working with them probably 10 years after all of that. And it was like they were the best old friends in the world. And I didn't know they'd even ever, ever been married. I just, you know, knew of I knew of her as being the singer in his band. Anyway, it, it was a very great experience. It was very fun working with both of them. Sweet people. So when uh, the, I'm just a gigolo, the, uh, when David Lee Roth did yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, he copied. I mean, he. Oh, yeah. He had, he had all the moves in there. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't. Uh, he didn't try to mess with that classic. No, how how can you? <laughs> right. Uh, it, it would take I all the time out of it. Uh, I made a mistake 
once when that that one label it was a couple of ladies i forget their name they wanted to do hey boy hey girl louis prima the soundtrack uh -huh. and i didn't really know about that movie I, I learned about it later and i was like you sure you want to do that and i think me just saying you sure you want to do that they didn't do it and i wish i would known more at the time i'd right. have been encouraging them like like oh great right but I didn't really know, and I, I, I was like, "You sure?" But uh, such an entertainer, man, and and, and great musician, and just uh, you know, and he's being from Louisiana. I always, you know, I like to learn about uh, things. I, I when I lived there, I didn't really recognize uh -huh. that. But uh, well, I have a couple of stories like that. First okay. one is, you know, I didn't get into. I guess what you would call traditional jazz until like the early eighties, maybe 82, 83. Yeah. Um, Cause my brother-in-law at the time was a huge jazz freak. And he re he turned me on to all the best jazz, which I had not heard. I mean, the j jazz to me was like the jazz funk that was happening in the mid seventies. And so it's like I had crusaders albums, but I'd never heard the jazz crusaders, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and the, the amazing thing is in the mid seventies, I worked with both Freddie Hubbard and Donald Byrd. And I knew nothing about their history. I, I knew what I was hearing then, you know, and I really liked them both as artists and trumpeters. I thought they were amazing. But I didn't know about the Blue Note stuff or the Verve Impulse, you know, whoever. So that was kind of funny. But the other funny thing was, also, you'll, you'll appreciate this. In the mid-70s, probably 76, um, I worked with Steve Cropper. No kidding. Now, I was a huge fan of Booker T and the MGs. And I remember the you have a picture hanging on your wall at blue heaven of a Steve Cropper. And that's the Steve Cropper that I knew from the records. So when I worked with this guy, Steve Cropper, even though he had a Southern accent, I didn't even connect it, man. I didn't know I was working with Booker T Steve Cropper, you know, uh, green onion, Steve Cropper. I didn't know. It's so crazy looking back on it. Well, I've got a little story. He played with Dave Mason. I, I'm, I'm real good friends with Dave Mason now. And I've showed him the pressing plan. And we're doing his new album, and he wants me to do anything to do with vinyl. So he, he came through yeah, town. Yeah, I did that pink, pink, what was that called? Pink lipstick or whatever it was, album? For you, for uh, him? Alone together. Oh, you cut, you cut no, alone no, 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 together. No, 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 later, when you had your pressing plant. I think it was called Pink Lipstick. It was a Dave Mason album? Maybe, maybe. I, I, I mastered it. You pressed it. Oh, is that right? I, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I kept getting on. emails from this David Mason guy, and I had no idea it was the Dave Mason until I, when I spoke to him on the phone, it was like, oh my God, it is Dave Mason. Well, you know, he, he's got such an American accent now. Yeah. He's been here so long that he doesn't, but a very cool guy. Anyway, him and Steve Cropper did a tour and they played in Salina. So awesome. We hung out with him for like two, two days. And, uh, so after the concert, we're backstage and Steve Crawford's telling me story after story. In fact, he's from Missouri and his his cousin was the the, the postmaster or the, or the postal person. I bring my first when I first started bringing her records at the post office. So I had that connection with him. But he's telling me story after story about, you know, uh, stacks and. And the lady that runs the, the 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 venue, the theater, Jane, she's great. I love Jane. And she's like, uh, Chad, we're going to be closing now. And I just want to say, yeah. Jane, Steve Cropper is on a roll. He's telling story after story that's never been told or heard. I mean, like, like, I mean, I knew she knows he was important and all that. Right. But right. like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Jane relax you know please don't interrupt this right and uh and so we hung out with him and he said man if you ever come to nashville um so anyway so let's go back to um so you did the ray charles you worked with hoffman the dcc which all cut a lot of good records great stuff so you know, um, I've tried to, you know, uh, Stephen, you work together, but you were the cutter, you know, and uh, a lot of times I've tried to 
um, not rewrite history or anything, but try to give you the credit where you was due uh, just to try to make things, you know, set the story straight. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of those records, I don't know if you quite got as much credit as I think you might have should have got. And, and and I think uh, history has kind of corrected it. But uh, that, but anyway, you cut most of those DCCs. Uh, now, he was, um, you know, shaping them the way he, you know, he wanted them to sound and you were cutting. So if y'all don't like the way they sound, don't blame Kevin. No, well, no I would say that probably 85% of the time we agreed. One of the yeah. few albums that we really butted heads on was Pet Sounds, which I felt like I got to correct later on. But anyway. Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. And, you know, when, when we did do Pet Sounds and, and you cut it, you know, I used that as the, uh, I mean, as one of the records that I listened to. And, uh, you know, it was, the DCC was a little way too smooth for me. You yep. know, it's just. It was, let's face it, it was sucked out in the mid range. So um, we're going to get to those. Um, it's so funny how many things that we I wanted to get through or talk about or brought up because of your earlier history, like the Buddy Holly and stuff like that. So, so, um, all right. So you worked at Future Disc from, for what years? From, um, from 94 up until uh, right after 9-11. It was like, I think, October of, of uh, 2001 that uh, okay, then, then what I was left. your next job from there? What's that? Your next job. Where did you go? Acoustic. Okay, Acoustic. Yeah. All so, right, well, so well, actually, but, but, but let me back up. Um, in 1997, I got a call from Don McGinnis, who owned RTI, and, you know, Don and I had gone way back because RTI was, most people don't know this, but Location Recording Service and RTI were sister companies, literally. Right. I didn't they were, even know that. There was even some family ownership back and forth. Bill so, Bowers? Yeah, with Bill Bauer. Yeah. Bill Bauer and and uh, the other owner of LRS besides Steve Guy, who passed away in the interim, was Al Freyberg. And Al Freyberg and his wife were friends with Bill Bauer and his wife. They went to college together. I think at UCLA. So, um, so basically they were doing syndicated radio shows at location recording service, like Casey Kasem's American top 40 and, you know, all of those syndicated shows, Rick D's, uh, uh, yeah, anyway. So one night they were having dinner and Al said to Bill Bauer, you know, if you guys would start a pressing plant, we could keep you loaded with work. And Bill said, well, tell me more. He was in the pharmaceutical business and was having like problems with that. You know, it, it, he didn't like the idea of pharmaceuticals and he was working for a pharmaceutical company. So he wanted to get into a different business. So boom, I mean, like within two years, he did it. So I think this is like in 72 or 73. I don't remember the year that RTI opened. But um, so anyway, um, so Don had gone to work for RTI as a sales rep, probably 78, I'm guessing. I don't remember exactly, 79, 80, somewhere in there. And he wound up buying the company from Bill Bauer. And so anyway, so we, we had a long history. And uh, so Don calls me up one day at FutureDisc and he goes, I got a weird request for you. Would you be at all interested in coming up here like one night a week and cutting records for me? And I said, uh, and he told me about the, you know, what, what you guys had up there as a mastering facility. And I, I said, yeah, yeah, I think I'd be amenable to that. So I would leave Future Disc, you know, at six o'clock at night and drive up to Camarillo and cut for the night. Had we already had Stan doing some stuff? Yes. And, but the problem was Stan was becoming very unreliable. You guys couldn't get him in as much as you wanted. You had more well, business than he, he was willing to do. So in 1994, um, or maybe it was 1997. This was 97. Okay, I well, I think I, me and Don bought 
acoustic uh, from Wilson. So we, me and Don flew to Utah to make, meet with Dave Wilson. And uh, Dave and Bruce Leak had a system in Utah uh, with the audio research amps, VMS-70. Now, hadn't that uh, been a reference recording system before that? It might have been, but Stan ended up getting one of the reference recording system. Oh, okay. Yeah, that might. I mean, you might be right, but Stan did end up getting. Okay. That might, be the, that might be the one I'm thinking of. Okay. Right. There. So um, me and Don went to meet Dave Wilson. I'll just tell you a little bit about that. So we go to meet him. And uh, he. 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 Uh, it's kind of a funny story. We were waiting because it's such a professional company you know, where they have like the, the the thing where the secretary opens the thing. Hey, I'm Chad. I'm here to see Dave Wilson. Uh, oh, Mr. Wilson. Yeah, Mr. Wilson. Okay. So he opens the door and he's letting me in. And he looks at Don and he says, Sir, sir, I'll have to see you later. I'll meet you with Chad. And like we're shutting the door. I said, no, no. He's with me. Don is, this is Don McKinnis, man, of RTI. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, sir. Excuse me. So we go and we get this on awesome tour of Wilson, which is a, it's a brand new building. Uh -huh. Beautiful setup, beautiful office. And uh, he brings us in his office and he... He has a like a, a, a fish pond. He has a uh, balcony, not a balcony, but a porch or a, you know, where you can walk out his office. And so he starts feeding the koi fish and, it, you know, the, they, the fish just are jumping. And it's like, I'm thinking maybe he didn't feed them for a couple of days to show me this little. <laughs> put on a show for you. Yeah, put on a show because those koi, I mean, he's, he was like, and uh then in and Dave has a, a Ferrari or a I'm not real good at these cars. It might have been a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. <laughs> what is either Ferrari or Lamborghini? If it wasn't one of those, it might have been Maserati. But I think it was Ferrari <laughs> or Lamborghini. The, the three big Italian companies. Right. So he he's got it covered, and we're gonna ride to his house to listen to some of the lacquers they cut. So of course. There's just one person could get in. Don rode with someone else, and so we're we're going real slow on the way to, to Dave's house in the in the Ferrari. Let's say I think it was Ferrari, and we're going slow. And I'm thinking, come on, man, <laughs> open it up. So he looks at me and he's got, well, I I guess Chad, you're probably wondering why, you know, what's the big deal about one of these cars or why I have it. So I guess I have to. I'm like. Yeah, come on, man. Let's, you know, you know, get on it, pal. I want to. So he's like, finally, because he's so polite and professional. He's like, OK, well, I think I have to. I mean, he just. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, I get it. I get it. You know, so we get to his house. Impeccable, beautiful house, white carpet. I think it was a white grand piano, but I mean, it was like perfect awesome house with a really good view right with with the whams so uh, it's kind of like he's like and there's only one seat which is the cat daddy sweet spot <laughs> so i guess he does another one of, well i guess i need to you're probably wondering what's the deal about these speakers you know like and we're like yeah like crank it and don's sitting there and he plays wins and war and peace and don's head's like and I'll never forget. I laugh my LOL, you know, how you <laughs> say it. Uh, so we, it was so funny because the same thing with with the Ferrari doing this to me, happened with the Wilsons doing right. that to Don's head. Right. And so we bought the system, and then we hired Stan. And Stan Ricker had to drive from, what is it, China Lake? Yeah, Ridgecrest. Yeah, same, same area. Right. And so... And he would drive to to uh, RTI, and he would, a long he would cover drive. a long drive, like at least three hours, right? I'd say about right, yeah. Yeah, and he would cut records for twenty four hours straight, you know. And um, 
Well, I think didn't didn't I thought he cut from like Friday whenever he got there up until Sunday afternoon, and then probably and, yeah. Like I, you know, I heard stories that you'd go in there and they'd find him sleeping, or you know, like I mean, you know, Stan is 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 a legend, and he needs Stan was to a character. be recognized as the guy that cut you know all the half speech for Mobile Fidel, uh, the original Mobile Fidelity, and. He also had a big Kansas connection because he went to KU. I know that. So later, when he cut direct string to bass, me, he was a bass, that? he was a bass player. Oh yeah, yeah. And he would go to Hope, Kansas, to meet some of the people that he worked for, like his first job out of college. Uh, so Stan was great, but I think so. Me and so, you know, just to set the story straight or whatever, me and Don made a partnership. It was acoustic sounds and record technology. And I was kind of proud that I come up with the name. Acoustic. It was a good name. Deck. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, yeah. Uh, acoustic Deck. And, uh, and Joe Harley said he came up with Blue Heaven Studios. And he's pretty sure he did. So he, he probably did. That was a good name, too. Yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Acoustic Acoust Deck. Record technology, the tech, plus we wanted it to be musical and the technical sound, right? Right. Yeah. We great. wanted in. I, I thought it was. I Perfect. thought it was a great name. So me and Don okay. went in half, set it up in RTI, started with Stan, but ended up with you. And I didn't know you, and that was Don. So Don called you. So go ahead from there. So he calls me up and he said, would you come up one night a week? And I said, sure. So I, you know, I would drive from, it was, you know, it was, it was a good hour and a half drive from, from Hollywood to uh, Camarillo. So, um, so I, you know, <laughs> pick up some dinner at a, at a fast food place and, and, and head on in and cut for the night. And uh, as late as I could stand to work. Um, and then I had to call George to come shut down the plant, which was always, you know, a pain in the butt, but, but anyway, so, uh, cause I didn't have keys at that time in, in 97. So that went on for a couple of years, although I think within months of starting, you know, I get, a, you know, Don says, you know, we could really use you two nights a week. Do you think you could come up two nights a week? So yeah. Okay. So I made it Monday and Tuesday. So I would come up work Monday and Tuesday. And then it got to be after another month or two or maybe a year. I don't remember. He says, you know, could we get you one day on the weekend too? So I was working two nights a week and Saturdays up there. And uh, after that went on, two things happened. In 99, I was able to buy the whole disc cutting system that I had worked on when I was at, at uh, uh, Location Recording Service, LRS. So in 99, they sold me that system. Um, when Doug and I built our Class A disc cutting system, we actually built two of them and so I had the second one. So I already had that. So, you know, I got the cutter head, I got the lathe and the tape machine that I used from them. I wound up selling off the rest of the gear for about what I paid for the whole thing. So I wound up almost getting that disc cutting system for free. And so here it is 99, I got my own disc cutting system. You know, I'm working, you know, two nights and a day up there. And I finally, I just went to Don and I said, hey, you know, you guys wouldn't be interested in hiring me. And so I guess he talked to you and yeah, okay, let's do it. So I started up there. Well, we spent the year of 2001 rebuilding the room because I wanted to turn it around 180 degrees, build really nice full range speakers into the system. Oh, oh it was yeah. nice, man. It looked nice. It was. It yeah, I was, I was very good. proud of that. The room was too small. It was, a, you know, but other than that, um, it, it was well, you know, everything's really always too small if you think well, about I'm, it. Well, I'm pretty happy with the space that I have here. No, you, you got a nice, it's, uh, it's <laughs> But anyway, perfect. so, you know, and then I was doing most of the cutting for you guys or for you at at a, at the Future Disc while the room was shut down. And then. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. did. I? Yeah, yeah, you did. Well, I mean, I you just forgot because the room was shut down. There was no, you know, we were doing construction well, I remember in there. That, um, so you started working in '97, part time. Okay, yeah. then and and my... and then in, in the year 2001, 
uh, a, a good buddy of mine and I did all the carpentry and we redid the room, built the, the soffited speakers in and did all of that stuff. And then in, I guess, late September of 2001, I went up there full time. Okay. So 97 to 2001. And then uh, like when four did years you... part time. Okay. And how long did you? I mean, he ended up being 14 years total, I think, at Kustek. Well, full-time and part-time. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, so it was like, you, it was just short of 10 you, years full-time up there. When did you stop? Uh, was it like 2014? No, no, 2000, uh, the end of 2010. The end of 2010. So nine, nine years, yeah. So, um and then in 2010, you, you went on your own? The, again, it's always the end of the year. Yeah, it, it, I, I think I left in like September of 2010 and opened up my room here. But we didn't really get fully operational here until like the early 2011 because I, I didn't have the room. I thought I had the room done, and then there were a lot of other little things that I want. You know how that is. Well, and you know, so, it's funny as we started uh, QRP around 2010 I know. Yeah, and we, 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. So, okay. So we got. Yeah. Uh, well, when I went up there full time, the deal between you, me and Don was that I was going to buy into the company and become a third partner. That was the original idea. And my buy-in was going to be my disc cutting system. And that was when you sold the existing disc cutting system. I think it went to master disc. Um, uh, Don, Don sold that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, we'll, yeah we'll I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, you write about, um, you know, that's why, you know, partnership, it, it's hard. I mean, even for three honest people, not that we really had any problem or anything, but, and I remember that, like, but, but it's, but you can forget it too. Like you just doing business, you know, you're paying Kevin as a, an employee and you kind of forget and, you know, I I don't. Uh, when you said you wanted to go on your own, you know, it's it's like Don has his business. I got my business. To hold up somebody from having their business, you know what I mean? Like you make a living on that, and that solely supports you. Where where for us, I wouldn't say it was a hobby, but kind of compared to what it is for you. Oh, I, I appreciate the same thing. As I sold. One of the lays that I got out of the RTI deal to Jeff Powell, and he cuts record in Sam Phillips' studio, which I was just in Memphis, and I and I, I kicked myself over and over by selling that nice VMS seventy, which yeah, had the nice Ornithon, which you've cut direct to disc on, so you know the system. I kick myself all the time, but you know what I tell myself? I like Jeff Powell. He's a nice guy. And he's making a living feeding his family with that, uh -huh. where I don't have to feed my family with right. that the lathe, right? right? So if there's anything that makes myself feel better, it's uh -huh. a cool dude that's making a living where it's almost a hobby to me compared to him. Right. And that's when I I, I quit kicking myself. Plus, I've got three lays now. One, two, three. So I need to let that one go. I know about two. But, What's the third? You've got two from the. Well, there's ball. three. The three, three of the, the uh, what is it? Thirty twos. One a, one a, of a them is thirty ones. And one thirty ones. Yeah. Thirty ones. Well, the, the the third one is in a crate by itself. Oh. It doesn't have. It, it's just totally. It doesn't even have a, a platter. You know, one of those lathes is mine. I didn't you, know that. You've heard this story. No, Tom Tom Pisano and I were doing some electronics together. We were building LA two A's. And the deal was, you know, one of those lathes was sitting underneath oh, his work bench in the master lab. And he was yeah. he was gonna give that to me for all the work that I had done for him. 